Hi guys, this is where Lane Staley died on April 5th, 2002. Before I continue, I want to mention that this location is public domain information. There are several print sources, online articles, photos, and videos which list the address of this building. But regardless, I won't be listing the address in this video out of respect for the privacy of those living here. And I made sure not to use any shots of the building where anyone living here is visible. Lane Staley used to live here. His condo is this unit at the top corner. I want to read to you a quote from Lane Staley's mother where she describes the moment she first saw Lane Staley's body in the condo. I'll be going into detail about exactly what happened, but first, I want to start off with this quote because I find that this quote really shows the human tragedy in this all. Sometimes when it comes to famous people, it's easy to forget their humanity and to forget that the families of famous people are affected by death. Here's the quote from Lane's mother, Nancy McCallum. The police first went into Lane's condo, and then they said, I said, well, I need to go in and be with him. And they said, oh, I wouldn't do that. And I said, I can do this. I've always promised myself that if anything happened to my children, I would be there for them. And I went in and he was tiny. And I thought at first that he had made like a life-size mannequin of himself because he had lots and lots of art projects always. And I thought, you know, somebody could have thrown that little guy over their shoulder and walked down the street and nobody would have even known that it was a real person. I sat with him for a few minutes, and I told him that I was really sorry how things had turned out, because, of course, we tried to not pressure him. We always felt like pressure would just push him to the wrong place, and he knew what he had to do. He had to go in treatment, stay in treatment, communicate with his sponsor, stay with healthy people, but the music industry doesn't afford you the time to do that. And those aren't healthy people. A lot of them are not. It was pretty tough to get cleaned up. By then, he had pretty much secluded, been secluded. So it was shocking to see my child like that. It should have turned out better. And it's been amazing how many people have expressed their love and support. Lane Staley had struggled with drug addiction for many years, and after Lane's body was examined, the official autopsy and toxicology report stated that he died from an accidental speedball overdose. A speedball is a mix of heroin and cocaine. Lane Staley weighed only 86 pounds at the time of his death, and if you factor in that he was around 6 feet tall, it really paints a dark image of how severe the drugs impacted him. In response to his death, the surviving members of Alice in Chains released the following statement. It's good to be with friends and family as we struggle to deal with this immense loss and try to celebrate his immense life. We are looking for all the usual things. Comfort, purpose, answers, something to hold on to, a way to let him go in peace. Mostly, we are feeling heartbroken over the death of our beautiful friend. He was a sweet man with a keen sense of humor and a deep sense of humanity. He was an amazing musician, an inspiration, and a comfort to so many. He made great music and gifted it to the world. We are proud to have known him, to be his friend, and to create music with him. For the past decade, Lane struggled greatly. We can only hope that he has at last found some peace. We love you, Lane, dearly, and we will miss you endlessly. One of the most tragic things about Lane's death is that he was actually dead for two weeks before people knew he had died. On April 17, 2002, Lane's mother, Nancy McCallum, had gone to Lane's condo, though she wasn't able to get inside. More on that shortly. She went to Lane's condo in order to let him know about the passing of Demry Pirot's brother, Demry Pirot being Lane Staley's ex fiance On October 29, 1996, Demry Pirot died of a drug overdose herself. Lane had already been struggling from drug addiction for several years at this point, but the death of his fiance only made things worse for him. In 2002, the year that Lane died, Mark Lanigan from The Screaming Trees told Rolling Stone magazine that Lane Staley, quote, never recovered from Demry's death, end quote. Lane Staley purchased this condo in April of 1997, five years before his death. During those last five years of his life, Lane became more and more reclusive, rarely leaving his condo. Alice in Chains drummer Sean Kinney recalls the following. It got to a point where he kept himself so locked up, both physically and emotionally. I kept trying to make contact. Three times a week, like clockwork, I'd call him, but he'd never answer. Every time I was in the area, I was up in front of his place yelling for him. Even if you could get inside his building, he wasn't going to open the door. You'd phone and he wouldn't answer. You couldn't just kick the door in and grab him. Though, there were so many times I thought about doing that. The last time Lane recorded with Alice in Chains was in October of 1998, when the band recorded Get Born Again and Died both of which were released in 99 as part of the Music Bank box set. Shortly after, in November of 98, Lane Staley recorded vocals for a band called Class of 99, a short-lived supergroup which also featured Stephen Perkins from Jane's Addiction, Martin Lenoble from Porno for Pyros, Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine, and Matt Serletic, who's worked with Collective Soul, Cher, and others. The band recorded a cover of Pink Floyd's Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, which, as of the time of this recording, is the last known studio recording to feature Lane Staley on vocals. One of Lane Staley's friends has said that Lane was actually going to audition for Audio Slave in 2001, 
but Tom Morello has since stated this is not true. In any case, with the exception of one radio interview Lane Staley took part in on July 19, 1999, with the rest of the guys from Alice in Chains, Lane Staley essentially disappeared from the public eye. Lane Staley's mother Nancy has said that she and Lane's family would occasionally see him from time to time. The last time Lane's mother saw him was around Valentine's Day in 2002, about two months before his death. Now, going back to April 17, 2002, that day, Nancy McCallum went to Lane Staley's condo in order to tell him about the death of Demi Parrott's brother, but there was no answer. Two days later, on April 19th, Nancy McCallum got a call from Susan Silver, one of the people who managed Alice in Chains. Susan Silver informed Nancy McCallum that Lane's accountants had said no money had been withdrawn from Lane's bank account in two weeks. Nancy went back to the condo that day to check on Lane, but again, as was the case two days before, there was no answer. This is when Nancy McCallum called 911. Nancy, the police, and Jim Elmer, Lane's father, were all at the scene for this tragic day. The autopsy confirmed that Lane Staley had died two weeks earlier on April 5, 2002. By the time his body was found on April 19th, it had already partially decomposed. The last person to see Lane Staley alive was his friend and former Alice in Chains bandmate Mike Starr. In an interview on VH1 Celebrity Rehab, which took place in 2010, Mike Starr stated that he had spent time with Lane Staley the day before he died, which would have been April 4th. April 4th being Mike Starr's birthday. According to Mike Starr, Lane was very ill and Mike wanted to call 911, but Lane protested. Furthermore, according to Mike Starr, Lane even threatened to end their friendship if he had called 911. The two got into an argument and Mike Starr eventually stormed out of Lane's condo. Lane actually called Mike after he left and said, quote, Not like this. Don't leave like this. End quote. Lane died the following day and Mike Starr has said that he regrets not calling 911. Lane's mother Nancy was present during the VH1 interview with Mike Starr and told him that it's not his fault that Lane died and that no one in their family holds him accountable for Lane's death. Tragically, Mike Starr himself died on March 8, 2011 from a prescription drug overdose. The tragedy of Mike Starr's and Lane Staley's deaths are still felt by many today. With specific regards to Lane, up to this point in time, I've done interviews with two people who've worked in studio with Alice in Chains, Jonathan Plum and Paul Figg. Here are two clips from those interviews where they discuss Lane Staley's death. Obviously, one of the biggest tragedies in, you know, in grunge music and rock and roll in general was the passing of Lane Staley. Uh, when you heard that news, were you surprised by it or like how was your reaction to that news? Well, I mean, that unfortunately, like that's happened way too many times here at Lennon Bridge. I mean, to go through the list, you know, uh, Andrew Wood, uh, Lane Staley, um, Shannon Hoon, uh, Chris Cornell, like, you know, it, it, it's kind of hard to talk about because it's so much of our history. It's a lot of my history and these folks were just so brilliant, you know? And, and I, I guess I look at it like, we wouldn't have that music had they not been suffering what they were suffering with that led them to do what they did, whatever it was their decision or their lifestyle, whatever it was that brought them to an end, you know, their music represented that struggle. And, and that we all feel that like when we listen to that music, we feel their struggle. We have those same struggles, you know? So they, in some ways I just feel like, you know, they kind of struggled for us in a way. And, and, put those emotions, you know, on record for us to like hear and know that we're not alone. So I just think that's, that's really profound and it still lives on. I think it's still, you know, it's my, I love seeing a new generation kids in their, you know, 16, 17 year olds identifying with Allison Chains, you know, that are now 20, you know, it's not their genre or age, you know, but they're, they're hearing something in that music that's meaningful because it is meaningful. You know, because that band and, and those people were struggling with life, just like, you know, we all struggle with life. Um, so sorry to circle back around your question. Um, That's a great answer. Yeah, yeah Lane. Uh, we all knew Lane was not doing well at that point. So it didn't come to a surprise. It didn't come to us in Seattle as a surprise. Um, I think it was sad. We all were disappointed that it was heading that way already. So I guess it wasn't a surprise. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I was heartbroken then and I'm still heartbroken, but I, but I love that he put that music down for us. You know, he left us a huge gift. Do you remember what your last interaction was with Lane? It was so long ago. I mean, it, uh, yeah, so probably my last interaction with Lane was, was here doing, well, I guess it probably would have been my last, my last strong memory was doing Jar of Flies. And unfortunately, I can't remember which song it was, but it was that distorted story where he was singing on the mic 
and it was distorted and clipping and Toby was just like, that's it, we're keeping it. And I remember we asked Lane to re-sing something at one point and Lane was just like, nope, I'm not doing it. You got your take. And he walked out of the room. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Friggin' rock star. That's, that's Lane, man. <laughs> and we went back and it was like, no, that was the take. You know, he knew. That's the way I'd like to remember yeah. Lane, yeah. Is there any one Alice in Chains song in particular that has a special meaning for you? Uh... Well, I'd say Jar of Flies in general, just because I was here for the whole thing. It's funny, when you work on it, you, you develop your own, your own connection to each song. And I, I feel like I have my own unique experience of that record, because I got to work on a lot of it. I was really young, it's kind of a foggy memory, but uh, I don't know. Each of those songs, I, just, I guess I can remember little moments, you know, the band being around. And, and I'm really thankful that I get to have, you know, not everyone in the world gets to, you know be in the room when uh, an album like that's being made. So I feel really blessed to get to associate to that record in a really special way. The first Alice in Chains record you worked on, Black Gives Way to Blue, was also the first Alice in Chains record the band had worked on since Lane's passing. So, you know, with that said, was there any sort of uncomfortable feeling for the band being in the studio without Lane? You know, th that record, I, to me, I think, was their cathartic, you know, release. Uh, they did that, you know, the last song on the record, Black is Lake Blue, is their goodbye, you know, letter to Lane. And, uh, you know, if you listen to, the, you know, the first song, All Secrets Known, that's kind of sets the tone for the whole thing. And uh, it wasn't until everybody was, you know, throughout the whole record, everyone was all gung ho. They were really excited. Everything was sounding great. They were glad to be in the studio doing Alice in Chains again. You know, Will comes in, he's fresh new energy, and, you know, it was really fun. Uh, when we were tracking vocals for the song Black Gives Way to Blue, that's when things got really emotional. And, you know, everybody had to kind of take a break and let things settle for a second, you know. Uh, you know, just thinking about it, that day, it was really, you know, everybody felt like that on that song particularly tracking it. And I can imagine for William, I mean, that was his first go with Alice in Chains. Do you know, it must have been big shoes for him to fill. How did he feel personally? Do you know? I mean, you know, Will is highly intelligent and seriously talented singer. I mean, his range is so, you know, you know, he can get way up there and you know, he's got the, the power. Um, I, I, you know, he knew he had big shoes to fill. I wasn't talking with him a lot about it. You know, it was like he'd come in and work with Nick on vocals. Uh, I'd be there for him if he had a guitar part. And, you know, we, you know, just trying to be there and support him because he is, he's the new guy. You know, first it was, you know, Mike Inez and now he's, you know, he's not, he's Will. But, you know, now they're, they, you know, he's still there and he's still doing a great job. You know, when I watch those guys live, it's it's pretty impressive. You know, and, and, you know, some people are like, oh, he's trying to sound like Lane. And to me, he doesn't sound anything like Lane. He, it's like the polar opposite. He's got like a bright, almost wiry voice. And, you know, he's a tall dude. And, you know, but, he, you know, he's got the power. I did see him once with, uh, with Will, and I, I loved his voice personally. And I've always yeah. thought Jerry's voice sounds closer to Lane's than Will's personally, in my opinion. I think what you're hearing is you're hearing Jerry's voice on the old records under Lane, and that never went away. <laughs> so actually, yeah, you're right. You're hearing Jerry come through just more. You know, he he he's stepping forward a little bit, and you know he's he's becoming a better singer. In that first record, he was uh, yeah, actually all the way up until Black Gives Way to Blue, he was a serious smoker, like. I'd get to the studio, we'd work, and he's got an ashtray right next to me, and he's just blowing smoke right into the back of my head, like, all day long. And I'd have to, you know, when I get home, take a shower before I went to bed, because, you know, I smell like an ashtray. Uh, Devil Put Dinosaurs here, he uh, switched over to the patch and, like, really cut back, and and he, he could tell in his voice it was getting better and he had more control. So he, he likes that. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe for more because there is a lot more to come. All the videos on my channel are original. I'm the one filming, editing, and conducting all the interviews. So if you guys like what you see and you want to support, the best way to do so is honestly just to subscribe. Thanks for watching.